I think we can probably start now, now that the students are coming in. Okay, so my name is Elsie Christopher, and I'm very lucky to have Ms. Louise Jones, our university librarian, also helping to host it today, this special event, which is co-sponsored by the Independent Learning Center and the University Library System here at Chinese University. And we're very happy to see all of you, of course, uh, lots of students and some of our colleagues, which is wonderful on a nice Friday afternoon because it's so beautiful outside. So we're happy that you're here with us. Um, what we'll do is we, we will start by, um, I'll introduce the writers with Louise and then we will uh, ask the writers to do a little bit of reading of some of their work. And then after that, um, we will start with some questions, and then we'll see how all of that goes, and then later on we'll open it up for the audience uh, to ask some questions as well. So does that sound, that sounds good? Okay, so um, let me begin first of all by thanking uh, all of our wonderful writers, Mr. Nuri Mitachi, Professor Agnes Lam and Sushi for coming today from their three respective uh, institutions. <laughs> um, it's wonderful to have three very well-known writers in English that are based in Hong Kong. Um, we'll tell you a little bit about their background in case you're not so familiar. Um, and then we'll just basically share some of their wonderful writing and, and uh, observations and so on. So, Let's just go ahead and get started, shall we? Okay. So first of all, I will um, introduce uh, Professor Lam and Nuri. So Professor Lam, for those of you who, who are not uh, as familiar with her, she's very well known in Hong Kong in English language teaching in our profession, those of us who teach English here in Hong Kong. Um, as well as being a full professor, now she just retired recently from the University of Hong Kong. Very distinguished career there in the Center for Applied English Studies and then in the Faculty of Arts as well. She is also a prize-winning poet. Her representative works include Woman to Woman and other poems, which you'll see on the tables over there, Water, Wood, Pure Splendor, 2001, and A Pond in the Sky, most recently in 2013. In 2008, she was made Honorary Fellow in Writing by the University of Iowa and received the Nozzi International Poetry Prize. In 2009, she was commended by the Home Affairs Bureau by the Hong Kong SAR government for her outstanding achievements in international arts and cultural activities. Her research on Asian poetry in English had taken her to several Asian cities, from Macau to Delhi, uh, Agnes is a very good friend of ours, and we have known her for some time, and we're very happy that she's here and made some time to come and share with us. So, Professor Agnes Lam. Okay, and then next we have uh, a very well-known writer, who is Mr. Nuri Vitochi. And since I came to Hong Kong more than 20 years ago, I've been reading Mr. Vitochi's work, and laughing all the way. <laughs> very, very humorous and, and very entertaining. Mr. Vitaji is one of Asia's most widely published authors and chairman of Asia Pacific's biggest association of writers. He is also a columnist with a widely syndicated column and a website called mrjam.org. He teaches creativity and story structure at Hong Kong Polytechnic University. Uh, born in Colombo, Sri Lanka, he has lived in Hong Kong, is it 26 years now? Yeah. In 26 years. Uh, Mr. Vitaji has worked as a journalist with regular slots in many, many well-known media, including BBC, CNN, and NBC. Most notably, he was the assistant editor of the South China Morning Post from 1987 to 1993, which we're all very familiar with, of course and assistant editor of the Far Eastern Economic Review, which I'm sure many of you are also familiar, between 1993 to 2004. Uh, Mr. Vitachi has written more than 40 books. I don't know where you have time to write. <laughs> He's best known for the Feng Shui detective series among adults and two series, Jerry Tellstar and Magic Mirror, among young readers. 
He has been based in, at the Hong Kong Polytechnic University since 2004. And we have also had a selection of Mr. Vitachi's books as well as Sushi. So I'll, I'll let Louise introduce Sushi for us. So Mr. Vitachi. Okay, Sushi, uh, last but not least, is the author of nine books of uh, fiction and essays. The most recent titles are Access 13 Tales, published in 2011, the novel Habit of a Foreign Sky in 2010, she was a finalist for the inaugural Man Asia Literary Prize, and has an essay collection, Evanescent Isles in 2008. She's an editor or co-editor of three anthologies of Hong Kong writing in English, a fourth anthology of new Hong Kong short stories, The Queen of Stat Statue Square and Other Stories, co-edited with Marshall Moore, is coming out from CC Press in the UK. Um, Sushi is Chinese Indonesian, a native of Hong Kong, and she has long inhabited the flight path connecting New York, Hong Kong, and the South Island of New Zealand <coughs> until fairly recently. She, uh, from 2002 to 2012, she was um, on the MFA in writing faculty at Vermont College of Fine Arts, where she was elected and served as faculty chair from 2009 to 2012. She is currently writer in residence at the City University in Hong Kong, the Department of English, where she established and directs Asia's first international low residency, not sure what low residency, <laughs> MFA in creative writing. And she focuses on writing of, from, and out of Asia. Is this working? Yeah. Can you hear me? Hi, good afternoon. It's very nice to be here. It's nice to be back at Chinese U. Um, my sister taught here many years ago in criminology, but when, when she was doing that, I wasn't living in, in Hong Kong, so I never got to see her apartment and everything else, but she told me she loved living on this campus. So you're all very lucky. So I'm, you know, unlike my fellow writers here who both have new books this year, I don't have a new book this year. So I'm just going to read you uh, a story that um, was published in 2012 at the Kenyan Review, and there's a, I can give the website to, to you guys, because I, I can't read the whole story, so I'm going to read the first three and a half pages. But it's also coming out, that was online, and it's going to come out um, next year in an anthology um, where it's going to be the title story, and that'll be coming out in Wisconsin, University of Wisconsin Press. Um, I always wanted to write a story about fashion in Hong Kong. <laughs> so this is my story about fashion, and it's also my first piece of speculative fiction. So this is just the opening of it. It's called All About Skin. I went to Derma the week before Christmas to buy an American skin. I was apprehensive because Derma is expensive and doesn't allow trade-ins. But this salesman gave me credit on pretty generous terms and let me take it away the same day, which made me feel good. This was not an impulse purchase, you understand. I'd been pricing Americans for donkey's years. My last top skin, which I got 14 years ago at Epiderm International, was an Immigranta. It was okay, but only really fit if team with the right accessories. That got to be a pain. Going American, though, is a big step. After Derma, there's no place else to go but down, at least not as long as they're number one. You see, my history with skins is spotty. I stay with one a long time, sometimes too long, because change makes me itch. 
The thing about an old skin is that even if it's worn or stained, it hangs comfortably because you know where it needs a bit of a stretch or a quick fold and tuck. Before Immigranta, I wore Cosmopol for seven years. The latter was always a wee bit shiny between the legs, although I knew enough to deflect glare with corpus ceiling glass, my preferred underskin from subcutis. But I'm getting ahead of myself. A chronology of my history with skins will keep names and dates straight. It's sort of like skinning a lion. First, you have to shoot the beast. Like most folks on our globe, I got my first top skin from my parents on my eighth birthday. Now, I know there are some who start off at six or even as young as five, like the wearers of Nipponicas and Americans. We were a conservative family, though, and when I slipped into China Cutis, the only product line that People's Pifu sold back then, I was the proudest little creature strutting around Hong Kong. This was in the 1960s. My idea of skin began and ended with China Cutis basic model. Mind you, there's nothing wrong with basics. This one gave me room to breathe and plenty of growing space. During the teenage diet thing, it adapted nicely enough, although Ma worried about premature tummy sags. You know what mothers are like. If there isn't a real problem to worry about, they'll find one. For years, I simply didn't think about skin. Passing exams was all that mattered, so that I, too, could become a face-valued citizen. I practiced tending to wounds and cuts, bruises and scars, sores and boils. What fascinated me were bites, a plethora of bug nibbles bursting out on the back of my thighs, fang prints snakes sank into my ankles, crab kisses slashing my fingers, teeth marks dogs lodged in my shoulder. Papa was pallid the day I came home from the beach, my back and arms covered with huge red splotches. They looked awful but didn't itch, which was merciful, and disappeared the next day. Sand crabs, Ma said, durable, my old China cutis. There are days I miss it. My problem began round about age 19. Being ambitious types, my parents packed me off to schools abroad. I salivated at Derma's store windows in New York, desperate for an American. They were all the rage and outrageously expensive. You can buy that yourself when you're earning your own money, Papa declared. I can't afford it. I stormed and pouted, scratching my face and legs till they bled, giving Ma something to really cry about. He wouldn't relent. It wasn't just the money. He and Ma had worn their old china cutises since they were eight and couldn't see why I wouldn't do likewise. From their perspective, I was acting like a spoiled brat. They were right, I suppose, but you find me a 19-year-old who isn't stuffed full of the fashion of her times. So I passed the exams, got my face valued citizen parchment, and by the mid-twenties had this great job in advertising. Paris, three times a year. Imagine, it was a pretty exciting life, I must say, despite my skin. In the spring of 79, I dared to visit Antigone of Paris. If you think Derma's hot, you've never shopped at Antigone. From the moment you enter their store, no, store is too pedestrian, their boutique, you're engulfed by the unimaginable possibilities of skin. Moisturizer wafts through the atmosphere. Never, never, it whispers, will even the tiniest blemish dare to mar this surface. Charmé. You wander around this cutaneous paradise where an array of products tempts you with seductive promise. Euro trash tennis, decadence glorious, romance du monde ancien, French chic. Skins, meters upon meters of skins, both natural and quality synthetic, draped fetchingly, lovingly, placed with the kind of care that plunges skin deep. The sales lady offered to take my old china cutis in trade, saying it was in big demand and commanded good resale value. 
Second hands were rare because few wearers upgraded back then. I really didn't care one way or another because I was sick to death of China cutis. I mean, it couldn't tan or wrinkle, and even a little makeup made me feel all Susie Wong. The only reason I stuck it out so long was, well, family is family after all, but enough is enough. It was time to go Cosmopol. The beauty of Cosmopol is its flexibility. I could slip in and out of it into something more comfortable whenever I wanted. China cutis stuck to me like a fragile layer of dry rice glue. It flaked periodically, showers of scarf skin, and had to be treated with such respect. That was the worst part. The respect. 4,000 years of research and development had gone into its design. Personally, I thought the design had already run its course, but then I've always been one step too many beyond, as Ma says. When Chairman Mao, the primo China cutest wearer of the last century, created a big to-do by jumping into the Yellow River, thus proving its durability, it was downright asinine. But the truth of the matter is my China cutest had gotten loose and sloppy. Fashion-wise, the look was making a small comeback by then, but not in any real way. Mine sagged. I wallowed in free space. Ma had suggested I return it for a newer model, but those weren't a marked improvement. People's Pifu hadn't modernized their product line for global consumption yet. It was just an ill-destined style. So I traded it in. My father would have killed me had he known. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That's such an interesting metaphor. <laughs> um, I'm so lucky to be studying here, to have this library. I have always wished to have had the chance to study at CUHK because your campus is actually much nicer than the campus at HKU. <laughs> but I didn't study there either, so I'm very glad to be here visiting today. Thank you for the honor. I'm going to read uh, maybe five poems. Um, the first one I'm going to read uh, was something that I thought about a lot when I was a teenager, so just one or two years younger than you are. Um, so I was thinking very much about why people should have children, so came this poem. But of course I didn't write it when I was a teenager, I thought about it. My Cerebral Child On the walls of my cerebral womb, you are knocking. You scratch on my inner membrane as I'm about to sleep, tickling me through my dreams, wanting to be fed. On the morning bus, you want to chat. Between classes, you whine for petting. You nudge me when I do laundry, chuckle to yourself during dishes, and prattle incessantly as the news reel. Let me out, you are 30. Child of my imagination, what do you know of the wombless world? Tonight on live TV, the challenger explodes before school children's eyes. An earthquake in South America leaves babies behind, muddied all over with lava debris. From California to kindergarten matrons are charged with child abuse. And here in Singapore, we are talking of total defense missed streaming exams. Child of my imagination, what have I to offer you beyond my uterine walls? How should I reply? If you should ask why we are eating strawberries on vanilla 
when infants in Ethiopia are stuffed hollow or bone marrow? Should I offer you charity and comfort in eternity as an answer? And would you then ask, why didn't you let me remain timeless from the start? Child of my imagination, would it be enough for me to say, there in my womb I have loved you? I have hoped you will make this world more livable. Or would you regret and rather be fed, loved, clothed, always in my imagination, my cerebral home? Tell me, I am 30. I'm greatly encouraged actually to see young people getting married and having children again in Hong Kong. If not, when I get to be 90 years old, which isn't that far away, that there will not be enough people to do the work. <laughs> All right, the next poem I'm going to read um, was actually inspired by a newspaper article that I saw several years ago. I think you were too young to remember at that time. It wasn't just in the newspapers, it was also all over TV. Um, I think as I read, maybe you will know what happened. A Child's Sandal In the early morning, walking to the bus, I see a yellow sandal hanging on the end of a branch of a tree in the green ravine. A size so small it has to be for a child of two or three. How did it get there? Someone picked it up from a rubbish dump? Too cute to leave behind? Was the mother caring so much she did not know the child had dropped a sandal? Or was it thrown through a window from a home in the block nearby? If so, why? Were there adults quarreling? A child crying at the door? Did the man have a mistress? And the wife wish to kill herself? Was it just the sandal that was flung where is the child now? Does it have shoes to wear somewhere? That was written after a woman threw her children from a building and then jumped down herself yeah. in Hong Kong. Okay, next one. It's about Hong Kong. It's about one of our islands, uh, Lama Island. I had this friend uh, who was a great photographer. Actually, I'm sure a lot of you are great photographers now, but I never took a camera into my hands until a few years ago. So I was extremely impressed. I was extremely impressed with all kinds of photographers and also artists. I also had another friend who was uh, painting. In fact, he painted the, the two um, paintings that I used for my first two books. It's called uh, Joseph Lee. But the photographer that I was looking for to at was called Mark, Mark Melby. He was my colleague. Can you hear well? Okay. Yes. <coughs> Okay, once upon the Lama Hills. Once upon the Lama Hills, there was a man in flowing white. One of the ancients, so it seems, painting into the air. With his hands, his feet, every muscle of himself, 
every cell in his body, all emotions he had ever felt blended into one, bare contours of a crane, another, and another. There was no one around him. There had never been anyone. Only the hills from of old and the sky hanging low. He needed no palette of ink in different colors. For at the cleft of time, when a particular sun shines through the fog, a few times in each century, the cranes he drew will flutter alive into the wind in shades of all imagination, always a little before the colors of a season. If you take the ferry from the IFC in Central, after you pass the Pofulan shoreline on your left, walk for about 15 minutes from the pier through the bustle of restaurants from every clime and land, cotton baskets from restaurants, Thai desserts spilling from shops, estate agents selling apartments a million each, goldfish circling each other in glass bowls, silk scarves from China caressing your arms as you pass. You will find a narrow footpath winding its way up to the Lama Hills. If you leave family, lovers, strangers behind and go alone to the crest of the Lama Hills at the crack of time when the mist lifts, the dawn breaks, you may see these birds of heaven still rising above the hills.